Hi folks, welcome to this dairy special on Farm Tech Talk. At the outset, we'd like to acknowledge the support of MSD Animal Health, FBD, Borbia, and Ornua in bringing this outside broadcast to you. I'm joined on the line here by Aidan Brennan, dairy editor with the Farmer's Journal. Aidan, you're welcome. Thanks, Jack. Um, First of all, I suppose it's it's been an, a kind of I suppose a, a, um, a big week in terms of dairy farmers because milk price has dropped by two cents a litre in most of the big processors. Um, would you say that's been expected or unexpected, Aidan? Yeah, Jack, it's a, it's a, I suppose a bitter pill for a lot of farmers to take. Uh, not a, I suppose a, a milk price drop was expected at some stage during the year with all that's going on with uh, with COVID nineteen, but not this early in the year. You'd have to say, or not by as much. Because like in most farmers would would be under the impression that a lot of the milk uh, for March would have been forward sold um, at probably better prices than what we're receiving now. So farmers wouldn't have expected the, the price drop to be as much as it is uh, or to be as, in, as early as it is in the year, I suppose. So uh, I suppose it's a, a, a non-pleasant surprise for a lot of farmers. Yeah, exactly. Um, so w with that in mind, I, I put a call into uh, Colin Kelly, head of strategy at, Ar at Arnua, um, earlier today, just to kind of get a feel for where we are in terms of milk supply and demand on a kind of a global perspective. And I suppose what he's what his thoughts are for the next couple of months. So let's listen to Colin and here's what he had to say. If we look at supply first, see Jack, and we look at the overall milk picture in the milk pool, if we think back to pre-COVID, milk had been pretty strong in, in Q4, it actually had been weak at the start of 2019. We're seeing the opposite this year in that it started very strong. If you look at the overall global supply from a milk perspective, global milk is up 1.2%. If we were talking this time last year, that figure would have been a negative 0.5%. Um, and there's probably three key regions that are driving that, namely the US, Europe and New Zealand. Um, this year, the US is up 1.3%. At this stage last year, that was a plus 0.6%. Europe um, is a big driver in terms of the overall 1.2%. This year, Europe at this stage last year was actually negative 0.7%. This year, it's up 1.1%. And then if we look at New Zealand, again, a big swing there, which is probably helping to keep things a little bit under control in that they're negative 1.9% for the season and at this stage last year we would have been talking about them being plus 4.3 percent so overall milk is is pretty strong stronger than it obviously was last year we're hearing stories of milk being dumped in the uk and the us in particular the figures that are coming out is that there was two percent of the uk's milk was actually dumped and unprocessed last week and a much bigger figure in the us at eight percent um, when we talk about demand, we talk predominantly around retail and food service. Um, and we talked a little bit last week in terms of the impact that there's a the switch, I suppose, the swing there's been in terms of retail and food service based on the change in, in buying patterns. We're not seeing much of a change um, on that from where we would have talked about last week. Still, obviously, a 60 40 split in terms of retail and food service historically. Retail probably moving down towards the 20% expected increase, no signs of food service yet, in, yet getting back to life. Um, and I suppose that's the great unknown from a supply demand perspective. Um, obviously there's a couple of unknowns, but when the world gets back to, to normal, people eating out, uh, traveling again, that's probably the key thing from a demand perspective. And then also if you look at maybe Middle East and, and North Africa, which from a European perspective and from an Irish perspective, very important from uh, powder exports. To sum that up, what we would say is that supply is strong um, and it's probably going to be in the region of 1% to 1.5% up. At the moment, demand you're still looking at being behind in that region of 10 to 15%. Are, are we seeing again any kind of green shoots in terms of China and you know, people and work getting back to normal and markets getting back to normal in China? Yeah, definitely. China is, a, I suppose, a great unknown, but some of the signals coming out of there 
in the last number of days and the last week or two, in fact, have been quite positive in that people are getting back to work, flights are recommencing from a, a domestic travel perspective, people are back out in, in bars and restaurants and we've seen some pictures online and through our own team in, in Ornua of people back out socialising again, which is definitely positive. Um, to put maybe in context of what China means to the world from a dairy perspective, the import over the equivalent of over 11 billion litres of milk, which is 1.4 times Ireland's annual output. And if we look at the significant products that they import, they will be maybe related from an Irish perspective or a European perspective. They import three, over 350,000 tonnes of skim milk powder every year. 420,000 tonnes of infant formula, 725,000 tonnes of whole milk powder and 831,000 tonnes of liquid milk. From a European perspective, we form a, a significant portion of their infant formula at just over 260,000 tonnes. Their skim were about 130,000 tonnes. Their whole milk were not um, particularly significant, but as you say, if New Zealand is back on milk that may create some opportunities from a European and an Irish export perspective and we account for a little bit over half of their, their liquid milk. So they're a very, very important market. I think the first signals we're going to see from them, Jack, will come through the GDT. So they were reasonably active on the last GDT themselves. Japan and Australia were the, the big buyers. There's another GDT next Tuesday. The volumes haven't been released on that as of yet. So once the volumes come out from the NZX, we'll get a sense of how much product New Zealand has to sell. And then as we run through the auction, we'll get a sense of how much uh, appetite there is or demand that there is in China. Excellent. Good man, Colin, you're dead right. Yeah, we'll be watching it hard over the next week or two in terms of where, where that demand is coming from and where is, if they're back in the market. So listen, it's been good to get that up, that, that kind of perspective in terms of supply and demand. Obviously, supply is up, uh, demand is, is disrupted and is down really net, net effect. So we're, we have surplus milk on the market, but there are some shoots beginning to come through, as you say, in terms of maybe New Zealand now in dry period will have less milk on the market. And I suppose the fact that China might be reopening. So Listen, thanks a million for your time and we'll watch this space. All right, thanks, Jack. Take care. Right, it was good to hear from Colin Kelly and his thoughts, I suppose, in terms of supply and demand and where the thing is in terms of China, etc. over the next um, couple of weeks and months. So with that thought in mind, I said, look, it would be interesting to speak to someone maybe from New Zealand and from the US in terms of what's happening over there exactly in the dairy markets at this time of the year. So our first protocol was we went to Olin Greenan, who was farming in Morrinsville over in the Waikato in New Zealand. Um, and we just had a chat with him about, I suppose, what's happening over there this time of the year and where his feelings are for, for dairy markets. Let's have a listen. Hi folks, I'm delighted this morning to be joined by Olin Green and a Monaghan man living in New Zealand. Olin, I thought you'd be a bit like Vinnie Corey now. I thought you'd have retired from farming at this stage. Like. Oh, I'm just <laughs> Vinnie Corey. Good man, Jack. You're just getting into my prime now, just flexing my muscles, ready to rock now for another 20 years anyway in me. Fair play to you. I thought I thought New Zealand you all retired once you got to once you got to 45, 50, that that was it, game over. Like Nah, sure. Look, at you can see that short of on me here, I'm starting to burst out as it is, Jack. So if I retire too soon, I'd, I'd be I'd be stepping up a size or two, I think. <laughs> Good man. Listen, uh, delighted you could join us. Um, Co Olin, if I, if I could just have a quick chat, maybe I suppose first of all in terms of COVID nineteen and the impact on kind of life in New Zealand, is the place in lockdown the same as we are here in Ireland, or what's the story? Yeah, look, it is. It is, Jack. Um, but I suppose being a farmer, we've we've come through relatively unscathed as it's business as usual on the farm. And I think we've a lot to be grateful for that, that our day-to-day -day business uh, hasn't been affected greatly. Day-to-day uh, -day life in New Zealand, however, schools are closed. Uh, all It's anything, only essential services in lockdown at the moment. So it's a strange, strange sight at the moment. And is there any uh, light at the end of the tunnel yet, all in our kind of what's the stage in terms of what are, what are they saying in terms of wh when the lockdown might finish up? Yes, there is, Jack. Just today they announced they're looking at uh, relaxing that back to, so they've got a, a level one to four. We're level four at the moment, but they're they're talking about bringing that back to level three. 
of course, there's a bit of confusion as what level three might look like. Um, look, they have overall, they've contained the cases, the numbers are dropping. There's a big debate going on, I suppose, about the, the welfare of people versus the welfare of the economy. And this is, I guess, the, the thing they're trying to balance that, uh, you know, contain the disease and eradicate it, but at the same time, keep the economy uh, or don't don't let it be strangled either. Mm. Yeah. Um, OK, listen, to move on, I suppose, into the kind of the business end of things. I mean, just again, give us a, maybe a feel for kind of the farming stage of the year. Obviously, it's a different time of the year. Like, I mean, in, in my head, it's, it's coming to the end of year lactation over there. In my head, it's kind of nearly, is it kind of, is it September time equivalent for, for ye in New Zealand as what we would have in terms of stage of lactation, et cetera, and that kind of thing? Yes, well, it is, you're right. Uh, you, in a normal year, it should be late lactation. Um, we generally would be able to milk to, towards the end of April, early, early May with a start of July calving. However, this year, we've, we've actually finished milk in early April this year, about a month month earlier and that's that's just due to weather conditions jack you're probably aware we've had a we've had a pretty 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 dry summer and as a result autumn rains didn't come soon enough and uh consequence was we had to pull the pin a little bit earlier okay so you're you're waiting on the grain the, the rains to come to give you a little bit of a boost and 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 bump up your your feed wedge i suppose to take you through now and until calving what did you say calving start the first of july yeah, about tenth tenth of July here. Yeah, that that's exactly right. Uh, we we do need we do need quite a an increase. We've got a pasture cover of less than eighteen hundred at the moment. That's New Zealand terms. Not 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 a lot of grass around at the moment. However, we have had you know bits of rain, ten and twelve mils sort of over the last ten to fifteen days, and that's just started to get things to life now. So I think uh, I think we should start to see a bit of a compounding effect in the next couple of weeks. There's more rain forecast, so. Hey, it's looking looking relatively promising, I think. Okay, so your 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 wedge is fairly flat, as you say. I mean, so you're you're moving you're moving the cows around the farm in 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 groups. Is that is that the is that the plan at the moment? We are we are Jack, but we're trying to move them around as little as we can. So it's it's uh, it's quite quite tricky at the moment. We've we've had to we've we've put in a lot of new grass and we've undersown some paddocks just from the damage from the the dry summer. We're trying to keep that rotation. We're probably on a rotation of 120 days, so it's not a heck of a lot of area for the cows. And pretty much 90% of that uh, of their diet at the moment is, is supplements in the form of maize silage and a little bit of grass silage. And that is the only way that we'll achieve our, um, our pasture cover target on the 1st of June. Good man. Ed, tell us a little bit about the farm, Olin. Is it hilly or mountainous or, or is, it, is it a flat and irrigated job or what's the story? Yeah, so the farm we're on uh, is just in Morrinsville, in the White Caddo. It's a peat farm, and it's as flat as a day. There's one one bit of a mound in it, and that's that's about all. Um, e easy to manage. There's actually two milking sheds in it, so there's there's sort of two milking platforms, but it will run. It's 214 hectares, the the whole block in one one unit. Um, the peat now struggles in the in the dry summer and it, it, it definitely struggles but in saying that it can take a lot of rain before it gets really wet so you know even if it turns cold and that it takes a while for the soil temperature to drop uh so look it has its it has its bonuses the the winter early spring management is very easy on peat farms to be honest Mm. It's, it's such a huge contrast but i mean if you look back on 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 2019 2020 all in terms of your production year it'll have been a good year for for dairy farmers in new zealand you know milk price has been good and in general they've got a lot of milk produced in in, in good conditions uh, absolutely um I fully agree we've had one of our best years financially this year we'll we'll get a a seven dollar thirty uh, payout is is looking pretty certain at this stage. Um, we we made quite a lot more grass silage prior to Christmas. A uh, little extra cost there, but the flip side of that, we had homegrown feed then to to weather the weather the lack of the rain rather than the storm in in the summer. Um, most people's well production, I suppose, uh, is looking like Frontier is going to be on par with last year. Or so. Nothing flash, but I think I think if you've done the right things right at the right time, you, you should be in a reasonable good uh, condition. Um, we we're not overly highly stocked here; we're relatively self-contained. I think that makes a difference too. Uh, just as a and give you an idea, Pam Kernel at the moment on the spot rate is making over four hundred New Zealand dollars per ton. 
Uh, whereas, you know, this time last year, you could probably pick a ton of that up for 220, 230. So it's pretty much double the price. And anyone that hadn't contracted feed, I guess, are at the mercy of that uh, open market now. Mm. I mean, all and obviously, uh, you as a dairy farmer um, and Fonterra are dependent a lot on China and that market effectively re- reopening. Over here in the last couple of days, the last week, we've seen images and pictures of China reopening. Have you have you have you got much feel in terms of you know how that market is beginning to open up again and how the the Chinese are beginning to get back to kind of normal post COVID? Personally, myself, I I, I guess I, I don't. Um, I suppose what we're hearing on the ground is that Fonterra had uh, strategic partnerships with with freight companies to keep product going in there and into uh, into some ports when when there was backlogs and others. So they've managed to to navigate some other product and not have these stockpiles. Um, I guess the demand will be the will be the. T- as you know when what what will demand It'd be interesting to see in a week's time what the next gdt will will give us because that that was a pleasant surprise last week uh, of a rise when uh you know if you look at uh at all the other markets they're all they're all heading south at the moment yeah and i suppose that that was nearly what prompted my question i mean the gdt was up and for me that would signal signal that that the chinese were back in the game that they were back they're back at the uh, buying powder again and getting back up on the road yeah, it's it's hard, hard, you know. We're all crystal ball gazing here. Um, I did hear one comment that people were saying that now, you know, if the price if the price is reduced a little bit, you might see a little bit more activity in buying because you know with butter when it reached its high, then it put people off uh, purchasing it. Um, I guess look at my thoughts without wanting to be too pessimistic. Uh, when we see the disruption to the service industry and you know your food service and the dumping of milk, I suppose whatever product can be then transferred into whole milk powder or other products, ultimately that's going to have, those shelves are getting fuller and I suppose when it's airtime to to pump out whole milk powder again, we could we could be challenged to find some shelf space. I'm hoping I'm wrong on that, um, but you know, there's there's only so much room for, for the world milk, so yeah, very interesting times. Uh, I guess we're lucky somewhat that we're not as dependent on that uh, fresh milk market and I guess the ability to to put it into non-perishable bags and whole milk powder is probably probably helping it a little bit. Mm. There's a danger Roland that that Banty McEnany mightn't be able to bring the uh, either the Ulster final or, or the the All-Ireland back to Monaghan like isn't there? <laughs> well sure <laughs> the, problem, the struggle is real is, is right I'm sure the Banty has them uh, has them training virtually or or, or, or they're probably running up uh, up hills around Monaghan with uh, five gallon drums on each arm. Sure, I'd say the show must go on there for them lads. You'll have the you'll have the Scots Town backs, the boy, Hughes boys to be back in back in action this year, like should they? All oh, right, so yeah, yeah. No, they'll all be ready for business. When it'll be? I mean, they might have to wear uh, the players might have to wear Wellington boots if if the if the championships delayed. We might be into a bit of bit of uh, pasture damage come into autumn if they're trying to kick a ball in 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 November by the looks of things. Yeah, they're t- they're talking about a knockout job over here instead of instead of the um instead of the ro- the, ro- the round robins as you so that could suit you as well, Olin. Like you know, I mean, Kevin, Ka- he might beat Kevin on the hop. Like you know, what I mean? <laughs> oh no, you you never know, you never know. Olin, <laughs> uh, I leave you. Listen, thanks a million for your time, and it's great to get a kind of a perspective on the ground um in in New Zealand in terms of what's happening. Delighted to hear you're kind of getting back up and running, and hopefully we can follow that line in the in the in the next couple of weeks. Fair play to you. Thanks for taking the time out. No worries, Jack, and thanks. A great initiative you have there, and I'm enjoying. Uh, I was listening to your to them on the, in the tractor oil of uh, busy feeding. So great bit of banter and very informative. So uh, good initiative and well done, and the best luck with it in the future. Aidan, it was good to hear from all in there. You, you've been over to Marnesville, you've been over to the Waikato. Give us a feel for what, what it's like over there. Yeah, I was there in uh, 2018 with Olin uh, on a new farm that he took on as, as a share milker. I suppose like the Waikato, it's it's the heart of New Zealand farming. Like we have an impression of New Zealand has been large, you know, thousand cow herds, uh, flat plains. That's all in the South Island. Olin is still in the North Island. He's in the Waikato. It's 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 the home of dairy farming in New Zealand. And I suppose in Morrinsville, the, 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 the town he's close to, 
is the center of all that as well like so it's real heartland type of stuff smaller farms i mean he's milking on two farms i think there's about 300 cows in each one but like when i say small that's small in in new zealand terms uh you don't get the real large farms over there or they're few and far between um so again look he's very much a hands-on type of an operator on, on that type of a farm he's on yeah you're right and you're familiar with our next speaker there as well uh, lloyd halterman so again again with the thoughts of colin kelly um in 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 our heads in terms of supply in the us is going to be a big deal coming up over the next couple of months i said we'd go and have a chat with lloyd halterman who who has been over for Dairy Day um, in in Punchestown for the last number of years. So Lloyd is, was over. So we said we just go to Lloyd and get a feel for what's happening in Wisconsin again, which is, I suppose, is where a lot of the dumping of milk in the US is happening. So let's hear what Lloyd had to say. To put, the, put it all in context, Lloyd, um, the reason we're chatting to you, I suppose, is because uh, we see a lot of pictures and videos over this part of the world in terms of dumping milk. Before we go there, though, I, I maybe just maybe give us a, a reminder, I suppose, of what you're farming over there in terms of cow numbers and, and I suppose, the, the markets your milk is going into. Well, we milk 1,100 cows. Uh, Wisconsin's a cheese state, so uh, we uh, market our milk to a cheese plant and um, we're marketing um, I think we're at the last two months averaging uh, about 91,500 pounds a day which is uh, probably 11 10,000 10, a little over 10,000 gallons um, and so that's uh, a high component over 4% fat and 3-2 protein so on true protein basis okay and i mean the situation is lloyd that these cows are indoors and you're kind of a, a maize silage diet is that right uh correct uh in fact this afternoon it's supposed to snow so they still couldn't really be outside on a pasture okay excellent um in terms of your milk price and how it has moved or is moving um, and how you are insulated from the market maybe just give us a minute or two in terms of of that piece the first would be the Board of Trade, where you can protect yourself from price wings by taking positions. They don't come without a cost. Uh, uh, you can get margin calls if the market moves against your position. Uh, another product is uh, called Dairy Revenue Protection. It's similar to crop insurance in the U.S. You have to pay a premium for the insurance. We did take advantage of this. Um, it looks like a good decision. About 85% of our milk is... Uh, insured uh which i imagine in the next six months uh, we, we are protected for the next till next june of 2021 uh <clears throat> it looks like in the next two quarters from march until the end of september it looks like yeah, if everything happens the way it looks now we'll be collecting and uh, at least it makes us uh, we get 90 percent of the revenue that uh we normally would have had with uh, decent prices. I mean, your your other big issue on, on farms like yours is having enough of feed. Um, so, I mean, again, I suppose, what's the picture from in terms of uh, crop yields, et cetera, and that kind of thing in your, in your part of the world? Well, last summer uh, is the feed we're feeding now. It was poorer quality because we had a very wet year. So yields were actually down and the quality was down also. Um, the alfalfa crop, of course, doesn't take this kind of weather very well. So um, we're feeding a little lower quality. We have plenty of volume, uh, but it's been being supplemented with things like cottonseed, which is a, a very good forage substitute, and soy hulls and other things were uh, brought in in general to uh, prop up the forage supply. Grains are very cheap, and we feed a higher grain diet. So uh, we're in good shape for feed. I think most farms in the state are still in good shape for feed. The alfalfa came through the winter now. We're seeing it's all greening up. Uh, it came through the winter a lot better than the last two years. So I, uh, I'm pretty optimistic going forward. In terms of acreage is sown in terms of corn, like, I mean, is there is there a big harvest on the horizon? Yes, uh, over they're projecting over 92 million acres of corn being planted. Uh, last year, about 10% of the corn did not get planted in the U.S. because of uh, wet weather. 
uh, if we actually get this corn in the ground and see even a normal yield, corn is going to be very cheap for a long time. So uh, if you're importing corn into your country, now's the time to, uh, to lock up your supply because it, it has not been this cheap for six or seven years. Okay, wow. Um, okay, Let, let's move, maybe move on just to the market side of things in terms of the pictures that we're seeing in terms of dumping milk, etc. Can you maybe just give us a feel, Lloyd, in terms of what's happening over there in terms of, first of all, the market, what has happened to food service pieces closed down, and secondly, kind of at farm level, what's happening? Well, everything's changed when, they, when the restaurant schools... Uh, in uh, what we call food service uh, went into shutdown because of the COVID-19. Uh, we have market, but it's all in the wrong places. It's, it, you know, fluid milk uh, disappeared off the shelves. Uh, the grocery stores had a big run. Of course, uh, bottling plants were already running 100% of capacity just about uh because we don't have as many bottling plants but they're all running capacity and in the u.s when we build something we run it as close to 100 percent capacity as possible well the things are in the wrong packages uh you know like mom and pop pizza plant uh pizzerias and uh restaurants are shut down so that food is basically in the wrong kind of packaging and to retool to meet the market uh, it, it takes a little time. So in the meantime, uh, the milk was backing up and there's no room for storage on cheese, butter and other things. So the price collapsed. We, we lost about uh, $5 a hundred weight, which is uh, probably about 12 cents a liter. Uh, not much fun but again the insurance for us the insurance is popping in if a farm did not take protection uh they're well below break even um uh break even would be about 32 cents per liter uh at the farm level and uh, we're looking at prices of uh about 24 uh for may Right. So the, the, as you say, there's there's going to be significant impact in terms of that farmer piece, because I mean, like, I mean, there will farms in the U.S. go broke as a result of the prices that they're achieving now. Is that fair to say if they're not protected, if they're not insured, if they haven't forward sold any of their product? Yeah, we've we're in our fifth year of uh, uh, at best uh, a little over break even prices uh, time to time in the last five years. So there there are some farms that uh, if you're over leveraged and you didn't take protection, uh, it, it could really cause a lot of hurt. I don't know if I can, if I'm enough of an economist to predict how many bankruptcies uh, the federal government is coming uh, quite a bit of, uh, quite a few programs. Nobody knows what effect those will have, if it'll be enough or to, to, to keep going, or if it will, uh, there are, Farmers my age, you know, I'm in my 60s. Uh, if you have a small farm without anybody to take over, you sell your cows and you plant more corn at, to drive that price down further. So, I mean, it's, it's to be a little cynical. Uh, so we don't know quite what the effect is going to be, but uh, you, you have to be optimistic or, or if you're not optimistic for the future, once this thing turns around, we could see really good prices again. Lloyd, in terms of where this milk dumping is happening, is it is it related to specific dairies or specific farms, or what's the story? Well, it varies from state to state. Uh, milk has to be disposed of when we don't have the right kind of processing. Uh, uh, there's not a lot of cold storage to store the product in, so um, so there is some milk disposal happening. I'm not sure if anybody knows how to track this. Uh, so uh, some estimates that we will have to dump about 3.7 million gallons to get back in balance. I think that's total. I don't think it's uh, per day or anything. Uh, it, it, it is happening, um, but it's, uh, it's not every farm. Uh, 
I think uh, some of the mill co-ops have got together and trying to do the least disruptive thing. They're picking bigger farms that have manure storage uh, that we can safely and environmentally control uh, the product so that it doesn't do any harm. Uh, and that's that's about what I know. We have not we have not uh, we have not disposed of one drop of milk other than to the market so far. Okay, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> and I suppose that I mean that's the the big question. I mean, if if feed price is as cheap as you say, and corn price is cheap, I mean, farmers, you know, they're they're in their nature, they'll be pushing for more milk, pushing for more yield. So it's it's a case of you know the farmer versus the market the market is saying we have enough at the moment and it's it's balancing that piece in terms of farmer demand farmer push to get more milk versus the market listen we have enough yes i i've never had we've only ever tried to do more more cows more production per cow um we are we are reducing production some uh we're pulling the diets back uh, and getting a little less milk per cow. And any cow that's not perfect, of course, uh, is being marketed. And the problem with that is, is that uh, in the last three or four weeks here, uh, some of the processing plants for cows and, and hogs especially have been shut down because they can't keep uh, the lines running. Uh, with the restrictions and uh, maybe some people in the plants that have uh, been uh, fallen ill. So the price of uh, a dairy cow going to uh, a sale bone is off about $300 a cow. And so this is really hard. You, you're, you're, if you've been asked to reduce, you need to send some cows in. You're gonna get clobbered there. The milk you are sending, uh, is really being hammered on so uh as far as price so it's it's an interesting time we've never really seen this scenario uh quite to this degree mm. yeah i mean you're you're right it is, it is quite extraordinary but i mean as you say for for you as a business you you for the first time have got a signal that listen we don't need any milk at the moment so you're making changes in terms of your diet and in terms of calling out those low, low producers so that that in effect is a is a is a is a is a big it's going to be a, a change for your system and for other farmers i'm sure in that scenario so look at the, the situation over here is very similar um you know for the first time i suppose now this week irish farmers are seeing a cut in milk price and that's that's the kind of first time that that uh irish irish farmers are getting the the hit and of course they're at a different stage of lactation Lloyd, where we're, we're starting off our curve you have a pretty flat profile I, I'm, I'm sure over in the us so it's a different scenario so um listen thanks a million for your time lloyd and thanks for giving us a perspective in terms of you know what's happening over in the us it's it's good to it's good to keep in touch and 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 maybe in the next couple of weeks we might have a quick chat again great i'd welcome that and uh hello to all uh my friends in ireland i certainly have enjoyed uh my visits uh in the last two years to uh, ireland a wonderful country and and uh, great resources and a great dairy industry so uh good luck to everybody and st stay healthy okay aiden um i'm back to you i suppose so we've traveled from we've listened from new zealand to the us they're both very different scenarios i mean new zealand they're drying off cows now at this time of the year a lot of them have dried off a month earlier in the us um again a, a flat profile of, of milk compared to kind of ireland or new zealand so they're producing milk all year round but they have issues there in terms of the market at the moment because of the fresh milk produce etc there's not the the food service market is not up and going i mean again bringing it back to ireland i suppose aiden um it's 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 you know it's mid-april milk flow is beginning to to improve grass is beginning to volumes are beginning to improve so it's uh, it's a different kettle of fish over here at the moment it is, yeah. I mean, uh, the thing on most farmers' minds at the moment is, uh, in, in terms of the on-farm stuff, is grass growth. I mean, we're seeing a big increase in growth this week again, and most farmers now have more grass than they need. 
and that's you know posing a risk because you, it's a call to action. You need to you need to start skipping over paddocks for silage, otherwise you're going to be going into too high covers. And I mean a day at this stage of the year, like I mean those covers could be growing a hundred a day at the minute because they're at that that real high growth stage. Um, like so, you, your grass could go from really good quality to stemmy very very fast unless action is taken. So that's kind of the main the main um talking point, I suppose, within the farm gate. And obviously then you know outside of that, then we're we're heading peak milk. We're a couple of weeks away from peak milk in Ireland. And I suppose with the issues around COVID nineteen and stuff, there's a little bit of a concern around that. But generally speaking, with our product mix, we you know we'll hopefully we've managed to manage it because we're, we're we're unlike the US, we're more longer life uh, products, cheese and butter and powders and stuff, as opposed to the real fresh product that can go off in a few days. So hopefully, um, we'll be able to come out of it at the other side with 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 a without having to dump milk anyway. Yeah, okay, and that's the milk supply piece and that's the grass supply piece. I mean, the other big piece that's happening, and you have an article this week in the journal, is is breeding is around the corner and you have an article on synchronization. With that in mind, I read that article, I said I'd throw a few questions into Fergal Morris from MSD Animal Health uh, to get his thoughts on heat detection and synchronization. Here's what he had to say. Fergal, good to chat again. Um, I suppose breeding around the corner, Aidan Brennan has an article this week on synchronisation and effectively it's a, it's a farmer from New Zealand who is doing, who is synchronising two thirds of his herd um, or maybe more, or even 60, 70 percent of his herd with synchronisation to try and compact the calving, the calving season, the breeding season and hence the calving season. Um, where is your head on in terms of synchronisation and what role it can play in the breeding season in an Irish scenario? Yeah, I think it's a good comparison with New Zealand. So we have an extremely tight calving pattern. Uh, you know, there's a, an enormous number of cows that calve in Ireland over a six week period now, effectively from um, the 1st of February uh, through to the, 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 the first two weeks in, in March. And to get that, there's no doubt that synchronization plays a role. Uh, I think that if you look at it, heifers in particular are an ideal group. They respond very well to even just uh, two doses of prostaglandin 11 days apart with um, heat detection at observed estrus or in some cases fixed time AI. Uh, I think in the case of cows for late calvers, there's certainly a role for synchronization. And again, I wouldn't consider uh, synchronization before 35 days post calving. You can do it earlier, but you tend to get much lower conception rates. So ideally start at uh, day 35. Some people will start at day 30 post calving, but ideally start at day 35. And in that case, you'll need more than just prostaglandin. That's the, the, the belt and braces approach really where you, you're using a combination of uh, GnRH, the progesterone devices, plus estromate, and then fixed time AI. And it does work well, uh, in, in, especially in cows that have, um, that have no underlying problems. And that brings us to the last group, problem cows. Uh, and there's no doubt about it in terms of Examining cows, any cow that hasn't been seen pulling 35 days uh, after calving really should be examined and, and just see what are the issues. So those cows that have had a difficult calving, uh, milk fever, ketosis, uh, even cases of mastitis can delay it. Um, and especially any other fertility problems if they've got endometritis. And I think that uh, one of the things that, that can be done now is the use of the Metricheck which detects for endometritis. So it's basically just a steel pole uh, with what looks like half a squash ball at the end of it. You insert it into the, uh, the cow's vagina and look at the discharge. And it's a very good way of indicating if the cow has endometritis or not. And a lot of information globally would suggest that up to 20% of cows can have endometritis. So, and those cows can be treated. There's a, there's a washout that can be used to treat those particular animals. Yeah, so you've identified nicely, the, you know, the groups of heifers that potentially where treatment could play a role, the maiden heifers, the uh, problem cows, uh, problem breeders, or maybe the late calvers, etc. I mean, where do you see the direction of travel in terms of kind of those, you know, wider based approaches in terms of ho whole herd synchrony or, or uh, you know, a larger proportion of the herd being synchronized? Where do you see the direction of travel on that? Yeah, I think that... Um... It's interesting, we had a discussion about this, Jack, at one stage that in other countries, we are seeing some restrictions on the use of blanket synchronization. So for example, in the Netherlands, some of the Scandinavian countries, and even in the UK, Arla are beginning to restrict blanket synchronization. Uh, so I, I think it's probably best to try and not do a blanket approach. And, you know, our fertility in Ireland is very high. We have very high conception rates versus 
other parts of the world based on the yield that we have, the, the grass-based diet. So our conception rates are, are relatively high. And I would, in my view, I think synchronization works well with those particular areas. So use it for the heifers, uh, late calves and problem cows. That, that to me makes the most sense. But there are some herd owners where labor is an enormous problem now. You know, you look at it, 50% uh, of the milk in Ireland is produced by cow, by herds that have 150 cows or more. And mm. you're very often having one farmer to 100 or 150 cows. Um, so labor is becoming a problem and, and farmers are trying to find solutions. Synchronization is one. Monitor is also one. You know, the idea of using the, the monitors to detect uh, if animals are in heat or not. And there's a difference in them, uh, in the success of them, the accuracy, but some of them now are really accurate in picking up heat detection um, to pick up uh, whether cows are in heat or not. Yeah, I mean, you're you're breaking into my next question. That was my kind of next question around heat detection. It's the next big challenge, I suppose, on farms. I mean, um, in terms of breeding, picking up these cows in heat. I mean, the automation of that piece with these, whether it's an earpiece or whether it's a piece around their neck or whether it's on their leg in terms of movement monitoring, etc. I mean, it is it is a developing space, I suppose, and a space that's probably going to come more into play as herds, large herds as herds get larger. Yeah, I think definitely as herds get larger, we see a, we've seen a huge uptake of monitoring uh, those heat detection devices. As you say, the ear tag, uh, the, the, the belts around the neck are the, the, the ones on, on the leg that, and they all measure movement. And I suppose we're all used to them now. We're all used to our, our movements. Um, we look at our phone to see how many steps we're doing a day or people wear the watches now. Uh, with, and it's a similar kind of device. It literally measures movement. Um, and they are very refined at this stage. You know, so, some of them have been around for 30, 40 years. So the accuracy can be very high uh, with some of those detection devices. And again, in, in places like New Zealand in the very large herds now, it's, it's almost a, a standard practice to use monitors. In fact, I spoke to the, the national sales manager in New Zealand um, for, for Allflex recently, who's originally from Tipperary. And uh, he was saying it's, a, it's something that they, they retain staff with because they're so effective at picking up heats, it saves a lot of labor. Uh, there's an estimate that, you know, the monitors can basically be equivalent to one labor unit, which at the moment would be a very important issue on, on the farm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's it's that time of the year when when everything is happening. So it's 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 a replacement, the labour replacement strategy, effectively, as you say, on some of those large scale farms. Fergal, listen, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a million for taking time out, and we'll be in touch again in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Jack. Aidan, we heard there from Fergal. I mean, he obviously thinks that this, I suppose, whole herd uh, treatment with with hormones for synchronising animals for fertility is not going to be a part of the future. Agree or disagree? Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd agree with that, Jack. I'd say the, the best investment the farmer can make now is to go out and tail paint his, his herd um, and identify the cows that are not cycling and treat those. And also to brush up on the skills for heat detection. Like there's, there's 12 signs of heat. Uh, how many farmers can name them all? Like So, you know, there's a bit of upskilling to be done there. Yeah, Aidan. I mean, one of the big changes, I suppose, over here recently at, at farm level has been the move to chlorine-free products, products, detergents, etc., for washing milk and milk and machines. Can you give us an update in terms of what's happening there on that side? Yeah, sure. I suppose the reason for Jack is is to protect the reputation of Irish products. So chlorine uh, potentially can leave a residue in certain products such as uh, infant milk formula and uh, butter. So we want to uh, obviously avoid that if we can. And most of the milk processors have moved to using only chlorine free products in their washing their the milk plants um, for the last few years. So the last step then is, is on farm. Um, and you see, the issue is chlorine is, is actually a very good product at cleaning machines that sterilizes the plant and reduces um, your TPC levels. So if you're look, going in into alternatives to chlorine, you know, they're generally not as good as cleaning as the chlorine is. So that's presenting a few problems at farm level. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, do you, do you see farmers, you know, taking, taking up on this like kind of sooner rather than later? I mean, are, or, or will they have a choice? They don't have a choice, I suppose, you know, very soon. No, I mean, the decision has been made to do it and it's uh, starting this year. So a lot of the plants, a lot of the co-ops, I should say, have already said that, you know, farmers need to be all chlorine free and more of them are implementing it now throughout the year. Um, but so then you're looking at your alternatives to chlorine and really you're talking about caustic. Um, so caustic would be more known to most farmers as being in a powder product. You know, you, you put the powder in and we have a few images of that, like into the into the wash solution. 
but you can also get it in a liquid form. Uh, the issue is that the percentages of caustic in the liquid form are an awful lot less than they are in the powder form. So you're talking typically about 20% caustic content in a liquid versus 80% in a powder. So, but the issue, so then you say, for sure, most farmers should continue to use the powder. But if you have an automatic wash system, you can't really use powder on those. And we know bulk, most of the bulk tanks are, you know, with automatic wash, so they need liquid. And a lot of the more modern milking machines are also automatic wash, so they do, they need a liquid as well. Um, so then you're going to, you know, you need hot water, which is the first thing. Uh, you need more washes, more rinses, and extra products in the rinses in order to, say, to keep the plant clean. It's a lot, it's a lot of hassle to be honest, Jack. But I suppose it's the only way we can we can we can work around it. But what I would say is that if you have a, a you know a, a standard type of, uh, you know wash truck in your in your in your for your milking machine, you'd be better off using the powder because it's it's very effective at cleaning it, uh, and you don't really you need less hot washes. Uh, you know, so that's kind of there's a lot of talk around uh, around chlorine free and a lot of milk the the milk processors and the co-ops have implemented, you know, different protocols or, you know, presented protocols, I should say, to farmers. But really, like, you can all, you know, you can't forget that you can still use the powder product is the kind of key message I want to get across. Okay, thanks for that, Aidan. It's something, as you say, it's a new piece that's happening on farm. So again, I'd, I'd like to maybe we'll touch base on that again, and we'll have another chat on that in the in the coming weeks and months. Um, so folks, that's that's it for this week for our dairy special on Farm Tech Talk. I mean, it's been a, I suppose, a, 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 an extraordinary week in terms of markets where they've gone, and I suppose the first signal at farm level uh, with the two cents a litre cut for a lot of pro for a lot of processors this week. So. Thanks to um, Colin Kelly from Ornua, Fergal Morris from MSD Animal Health, uh, Olin Green and over in New Zealand, Lloyd Holterman in the US, and our own Aidan Brennan here at home for, for taking us through and, and wrapping us up in terms of what has happened on the, in, the, in the dairy scene this week. So again, thanks to all our supporters and stay safe and stay farming. <laughs>